running a Proxmox server, it's uh, it can be incredibly rewarding. Oh, absolutely. It's this open source powerhouse. Yeah, letting you spin up VMs. Yeah. Orchestrate these, you know, complex clusters, really push your hardware. Mm -hmm. But for anyone booting Proxmox from an SSD, there's often this kind of nagging question. The where question. Exactly. Will all those constant writes just chew through the drive too quickly? We've seen, like, tons of online discussion, debates, tips. Right. And remember that uh, initial scare, that XDA developers article. Oh, yeah. Suggesting specific Proxmox services were just eating away at SSD life. And the advice was just, well, disable them. And that's really what we want to get into today. Our mission, if you like, is to kind of move past that initial panic. Okay. Let's unpack the real story behind SSDware and Proxmox. Find out what actually works for longevity, you know, and performance. So longevity and performance. How do we yeah. get both? Because what we've dug up from the community, it's uh, not always what you'd expect. Okay, let's unpack this. So that XDA article, it definitely kicked off a, well, a recent wave of these online discussions, mm -hmm. suggesting disabling a couple of specific Proxmox services. Cut down rights, simple fix. It really sent ripples through the tech forums, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. But what's fascinating, I think, is the strong counter argument that popped up almost immediately from users. You're saying the fear was overblown. Largely, yeah. Yeah. And we saw a lot of community anecdotes that really um, highlighted this. Like that one user, right? Running Proxmox on a Samsung 970 Pro SSD for over two years. And the key part. Still had 97% life left. And they specifically said without any special configurations like disabling logs. And they didn't hold back either, did they? Calling it scaremongering post from mainly one individual. Yeah, pretty direct. We also heard from another user, uh, two Samsung 980 Pros this time, ran them for three years. Hosting multiple 204.7 VMs on ZFS, which you'd think would be right heavy. Exactly. And they're where? Only 16, 18%. Wow. And it wasn't just the, you know, the fancy expensive drives either. Someone else mentioned a five-year-old WD laptop SSD. Yeah. Not enterprise. Just a standard consumer drive. Yeah. Still showing 97% life left. Yeah. Even after heavy use, OS reinstalls, game downloads, the works. It really does seem like modern drives are, well, tougher than maybe we give them credit for. And if you kind of zoom out, connect the dots from these stories, the consensus really is clear. Modern SSDs, especially, you know, from the big reputable brands like Samsung, they're just far more resilient. Mm. Like one user put it, modern flash chips can have many read and writes without any problems. It's largely down to things like uh, advanced wear leveling, built-in over-provisioning. Right, spreading the writes out, keeping spare blocks handy. Exactly. It extends the drive life way beyond what you might think just looking at raw write cycle numbers. Okay, so... Maybe the universal SSD wear scare is uh, a bit much, mostly debunked. For good quality drives, yeah. But then, why do some users still have these frustrating failures, especially with consumer-grade drives? This is where it gets really interesting. Yeah, that's the crucial distinction, isn't it? While, you know, overall NAND endurance is way better now, not all drives are built the same especially when they face specific workloads. Right. We saw some really frustrating stories, like, um, a 500 gig EB Crucial MX500 hit 71% wear in just three or four years running Proxmox. And the user pointed out, you know, the MX500 aren't exactly enterprise grade, but they're not the cheapest crap either. Which suggests it's not just about being cheap, there's something more specific going on. And it got even more specific. Someone else reported a 100% failure rate. 100%? Yeah, with consumer SSDs from Silicon Power and Crucial, specifically in clustered Proxmox setups. Hmm. But here's the critical bit they clarified. What was it? The issue wasn't NANDware. It was, and I quote, controller failures from tons of tiny writes and flushes. Uh, okay. That is a profoundly important insight. It means... It wasn't about the sheer amount of data written to the flash chips themselves, right. but the sheer volume of commands, metadata updates, cache flushes, basically the workload on the controller. And some controllers just couldn't keep up. Seems like it, especially some budget ones. Uh, Fison controllers are often mentioned, the kind you find in many consumer drives. They seem to really struggle with that constant small block random I.O. that's so common in Proxmox. Those Silicon Power M2 drives were called out specifically for failing in weird ways, too. Yeah, like the smart data would say, you know, 90% life remaining. But the drive was basically unusable. Exactly. Someone said, they still say 90% life, but if you install a new system, it will be dead in a week. Just completely unreliable. Ouch. And another user piled on saying, the only SSDs and USB drives I have failed before their time were silicon power. 
even AliExpress Kingsback are performing better. Wow. That's a uh, that's quite the statement. It really is. Yeah. It makes you think that's smart data we all rely on. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not telling the whole story, especially with these controller issues, like a hidden weakness. Precisely. It really hammers home that not all consumer SSDs are created equal. The controller, the firmware, it plays a massive role in how well a drive handles the kind of demanding, often small block, random writes you see in virtualization. Okay, so given what we now know about these controller-specific problems, mm. What about that original advice, disabling logging services? Does that still make sense, or was it just, like, barking up the wrong tree entirely? Well, the community pushback on disabling logging was pretty strong. Yeah. A lot of people argued, you know, the systems journal isn't writing gigabytes. Modern SSDs, like we said, they're smart. They batch writes, they cache. Wear leveling spreads things out. So the idea that basic logging was causing massive wear was flawed. Largely, yeah. A false scare, is how some put it. Rooted in maybe a misunderstanding of how modern SSDs work and the right amplification from default logging. Pretty negligible, usually. Okay, explain right amplification quickly. Sure. It's basically how much data the SSD controller actually writes internally for every bit of data you tell it to write. Background stuff like garbage collection, wear leveling, it all adds up. High amplification means faster wear. But for typical logging, not a huge factor on decent drives. Got it. But what's the actual risk then? If someone just went ahead and disabled logging anyway, is it just inconvenient or could it seriously bite them later? That's a really crucial point. One user warned, uh, making these changes won't break anything today, but they are landmines for future you. Landmines. Logs are just vital for troubleshooting, especially in complex Proxmox setups. If you turn them off, you're basically flying blind when things inevitably go wrong. Okay, so not outright disabling, maybe more uh, smarter logging targeted approaches for specific situations. Exactly. For some niche cases, yeah. Like um, Raspberry Pis running off SD cards, that's a scenario where wear is a huge concern. Right. SD cards are way less durable. Totally. So they're redirecting logs to RAM with something like log to RAM or sending them off to a separate log server. That makes sense. And what about inside the VMs themselves? Also smart. Reducing unnecessary logging by, as one user put it, filtering out crap that means nothing that definitely helps reduce overall noise and writes. But for the main Proxmox host SSD, the logging itself isn't the primary killer. The consensus seems to be no, not usually. It comes back to the drive quality. Like that user said bluntly, I've had nothing but shit luck with crucial drives, but my Samsung EVO goes forever. Hmm. Okay. So the real issue isn't the logging per se, it's choosing a drive that can actually handle the demands Proxmox throws at it. Which brings us to the enterprise drives. It sounds like for people really chasing that ultimate Proxmox setup, reliable and long lasting, enterprise SSDs are kind of the clear winner here. This is the real breakthrough maybe. That's definitely where you see the most reliable performance and longevity. And it's fascinating why they're better. Okay, tell us why. Well, they typically use SLC or MLC NAND, that's single level cell or multi-level cell. Right. These are just fundamentally designed to handle way more write cycles compared to, say, TLC or QLC triple level or quad level, which you find in a lot of consumer drives now. So explain the difference simply. Think of it like this. SLC stores one bit per cell, black or white. Simple, robust. Nice. MLC stores two bits, TLC three, QLC four. The more states or levels you try to cram into one cell. The harder it is to tell them apart accurately, especially after some wear and tear. Exactly. It makes SLC and MLC inherently much more resilient, especially for those write-heavy applications like Proxmox running with, say, Ceph for storage. Yeah, distributed storage. Very common. Or ZFS, that robust file system lots of people use. Enterprise drives just handle that constant writing better. And the real-world evidence backs this up pretty strongly, doesn't it? It really does. We saw reports um Intel S3700 drives used in a cluster for three years. 30,000 power on hours. And the wear. Showed 0% wear. Zero. Wow. And users who swapped out problematic Samsung QVO drives in their Ceph cluster for Samsung EVOs. EVOs are generally well-regarded consumer drives, but maybe higher-end consumer. Right. Higher-end consumer, leaning towards prosumer. They reported significant performance improvements. It just underscores the value of investing in drives with high terabytes written ratings. The TBW figure? Yeah, the TBW number. Drives like the Samsung 870 EVO or those Intel DC series ones, they boast TBW ratings in the petabyte range sometimes. That's not just a marketing number. It's a direct indicator of the endurance you can expect. 
So hardware choice is definitely king here. But okay, beyond just picking the right SSD, are there smart software tweaks, configuration things, tuning tips that can help push that lifespan and performance even further? Oh, absolutely. Little things add up. Like we touched on, reducing unnecessary logging inside your VMs. That's a yep. great first step. Right. And the file system choice matters. Using robust systems like X44 or... Um, ZFS, especially with proper tuning, can really minimize that write amplification we talked about. Right. ZFS came up before. That user reported only 16, 18% wear after three years running ZFS. Exactly. It shows how the file system can work efficiently with good hardware. And, you know, speaking of keeping track of things, yep. how do you actually monitor this stuff in your own setup? Good question. Checking smart data is the obvious first step, right? Mm -hmm. Smart CTL and tools like that. Yep. But with that caveat we mentioned. Right. Some drives, especially the dodgy ones, might misreport their health. So useful, but maybe not the whole picture. Exactly. So for real-time monitoring, seeing what's actually hitting the disk right now. Tools like IOTOP. IOTOP is fantastic yeah. for that. See exactly which process is doing the writing. Mm -hmm. Very helpful for tracking down unexpected disk activity. We found a great tip for those maybe on a tighter budget, too. Ah, uh, yes. The used enterprise SSDs. Yeah buying used enterprise drives from reputable sellers, it can be a really cost-effective way to get that enterprise gray reliability and endurance without the, you know, brand new price tag. Just yeah. gotta buy smart. Definitely. So if we kind of boil it all down, the key takeaways here, the real breakthrough isn't about being scared or disabling vital services. It's much more about making informed choices. Choices about hardware, about configuration. Exactly. Choices that empower your Proxmox setup for the long haul giving you both performance and peace of mind. Right. So for you listening, what does this mean practically? Well, start by choosing a high-quality SSD, mm -hmm. preferably enterprise-grade if you can swing it, or at least a consumer model with a really solid track record like those Samsung EVO series seem to have. Mm -hmm. Step one. Step two, optimize your logging. Reduce the unnecessary noise, especially in VMs, but please don't disable it entirely on the host. Remember, those logs are your lifeline when troubleshooting. Vital. Third, consider your file system. Robust options like ZFS or maybe XDEF4, they offer a good balance of performance and durability, especially when tuned correctly. Good point. And finally, monitor. Keep an eye on your drive's health. Use smart data, but maybe take it with a grain of salt on some drives. And use tools like IOTOP to see what's actually happening in real time. And you know, the online community's collective experience here is powerful proof. It shows that with the right hardware, the right configurations, you absolutely can achieve Proxmox success without burning through SSDs prematurely. Totally. So what does all this mean for you? Now that you have a better handle on building a Proxmox server that's, well, truly built to endure, what's next? What kind of innovative, maybe experimental project are you going to spin up now that you have this, uh, this new peace of mind about your storage?